The regular meeting of January 10th, 2017, Board of Education. Thank you all for coming. It's so nice to see a full house. Look forward to hearing what you all have to say. Mm -hmm. um, our first call of order is a public audience. Would anyone like to speak to us or say anything? Mm -hmm. Okay, then I'm going to just move on to <laughs> our Board and Administrative Communications. I'd like to welcome Emily Sullivan. She is our student representative. This is her first meeting, and we're very excited to have her here. And um, I will let Emily give her report, because I do believe also we have the principal of the high school here to introduce our new student representatives going forward after Emily's term is over. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, oh, Principal O'Brien, would you tell us who's here? Well, we have uh, Isabel Dorman and Dylan Fitch, who successfully interviewed and secured our positions for next year. This year, they will be here to uh, watch the proceedings at Lawrence Market. Right. Wonderful. Thank you very much for stepping up and wanting to be part of our process. And you have a couple things about Emily. Yeah. About All right. Sullivan. If you have not had the opportunity to get to know Emily yet, you really missed out on something. She's a wonderful person, an asset to our school. She is also uh, the recipient of a fairly prestigious award. Uh, earlier in the year, Emily joined students from uh, around our state and around the country, for that matter, in applying for a program called the United States Youth Senate Program. This is a program that exists to uh, promote leadership and also political and civic service awareness uh, in our government. And they select two applicants from each state to go to a national uh, conference in March at our nation's capital to participate in proceedings to learn more about uh, public service and uh, get a leg up if this was an area that they wanted to pursue beyond college and give back to our country. We have to have demonstrated leadership capacity, and that's something that easily fits into Emily's uh, DNA. <laughs> she is um, very active with our orchestra. She's done some work with Outward Bound. She belongs to three honor societies in our school, Tri-M, the National Honor Society, and also the Spanish National Honor Society. She was a commended scholar earlier this year for having outstanding PSAT scores. In addition to all of that, she still finds time to play soccer and tennis for our school. I personally cannot think of a better student representative for our school, our community, or our state, for that matter, to go uh, to our nation's capital in March and represent us. So, Emily, congratulations. Congratulations, Thank Emily. you for all the great things that you do. That's in great. addition to that, honor to go and represent our state, Emily will receive a $10,000 scholarship uh -huh. that she can apply towards college. So, great. really, Good way to start off the new year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, everyone. I'm really excited to be here taking over um, for Zeke. He had nothing but positive things to say about his time with you all. And he helped uh, prepare me for my first meeting today. <laughs> so um, starting off, this time of year, we're always running into the elementary school concerts coming up. So those are going to be within the next few weeks. We've got orchestra, band, and chorus concerts at Latimer Squadron and Terrafield. So I actually talked to some students the other day that are going to be in those, and they're really excited about mm -hmm. them. Um, at the high school in the music department, tickets for the musical 42nd Street um, just went on sale recently. So if you haven't gotten your tickets yet, I would <laughs> snap them up because it's always a great show. Um, we also have the winter dance this Friday, which is being put on by the uh, Trojan Wall. And other than that, at the high school, it's just um, quarter two ending next Friday, so a lot of midterms and just finishing things up there. Um, as I'm sure you all probably know, we have a short week next week with Martin Luther King Day on Monday and then early dismissal on Friday. And actually for Martin Luther King Day, we have a lot of students uh, participating in the event at um, the First Church of Christ right downtown. There will be um, high school students performing and also a lot of students from the um, Martin Luther King and Connecticut Committee will be doing a presentation on the new memorial downtown. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. Susan? Um, I just wanted to share with you the curriculum committee met uh, back on December 16th and we just haven't had a chance to tell you all about it. Um, we had um, a great meeting. We discussed a new unified arts uh, program that would actually be in an art classroom and so this will reach those kids who maybe don't want to go on the stage, maybe aren't athletically inclined, but give them an opportunity to um, partner up and have another way to express themselves and it's really going what well. it, it's going to be a great program and I'm sure it will be uh, very successful um, and that should be in the program of studies 
for next year. Um, we also discussed the redesign of the schedule at Henry James, which is, I'm um, sure you're going to hear much more about it, but we're starting the work on that. And um, it's going to be a great mix of the high school schedule and the elementary schedule. We're going to have trimesters, but we're going to do block scheduling. So we kind of, the kids will kind of have a foot in each pool, and it'll be a really nice way to move that transition for them. Um, and it'll give them great team time, and it just is very well suited, very well thought out. It'll be piloted before implemented, and everybody has been notified and discussed, and we're doing a really good job communicating with all the people in um, all the students and all the teachers, and I think that's going to be a really good solution to what's going on at Henry James. I think it's going to be a great way to bring all the kids along, and um, it's going to be very positive. And then um, the math program, we discuss where that stands and what's going on with that, and we've got um, teachers who are, I'm looking at my notes, sorry. Um, they're going to begin piloting the programs this this month. Mm -hmm. They've already started yep. actually with investigations three. They've started doing that pilot, and we just today finished our math in focus training. Uh, we had three days of training, one before the holidays, and yesterday and today um, for our K eight teachers. So um, once they finish the investigations pilot, they'll move into the math in focus pilot. So um, that would be my communication. So thank yes. you for bringing that up. So. Um, we're moving forward with the math uh, implementation program. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Todd. I'm all set. I'm Mike. All set. Thanks. Tom. All set. Uh, Sue. You'll be hearing certainly more from me later this evening, but I want to give the board two updates and two dates. Uh, tomorrow, the Community for Care is going to be meeting for a regularly scheduled meeting that will take place at 545 at the Simsbury Public Library. And our task will be to continue and hopefully finalize our planning for our March program, which will be um, focused on families impacted by drug use and providing families some additional resources and contacts. Um, so that will be taking place tomorrow as far as that planning meeting. We also have our SEPTO monthly board meeting coming up on the 18th and we will be putting the final touches on our program for parents regarding the Department of Developmental Services and DOORS which is formerly the Bureau of Rehabilitative Services. So certainly more to come as we finalize those details. Great, thank you very much. Neil? Yes, I'm happy to report about the completion of an important long-term <laughs> project out of um, my office uh, between hiring season and negotiation season. This, uh, we've been at work at uh, what, uh, through the state mandate of creating an all-hazard school security and safety plan to replace our old safety plan for the um, Simsbury Public Schools and uh, we reached completion at the end of 2016. I've been out orienting the principals to um, our plan. I had a chance to meet with Mrs. Willerup last month before the, the meeting last month to um, give her a look at it um, and it's, I, I, it's just um, about a, about a year and a half in the works to get to this point where we now have a plan that meets all requirements that the state um, put out in the legislation um, a couple of years ago. And um, after we get through budget season, I want to give you a little bit more of an orientation to um, what's in here, but certainly want to thank my uh, partner, Cindy Freelinger, who helped uh, get this thing across the finish line. And then also a district committee that reviews this that includes um, Scott Baker representing the elementary, Steve Petrita represents the secondary. Our two school resource officers sit with me, and certainly Kevin Kowalski is our um, district emergency management coordinator. Um, but important work and uh, really a model plan of where we stand now. Um, and I'll give you a little bit more of it when we uh, push through budget season. It's really impressive. And the amount of detail and, and the usability of the document is amazing. That in an emergency, you could find anything you need to find in a very <clears throat> rapid method. I'm really impressed by all the work. Thank you so much, Neil. So just two other things, as Emily said, we have an early release uh, next Friday. It will be a curricular day focused in content areas, grade level and content areas. Uh, some writing PD at the elementary level, science um, at the sixth grade, and certainly content specific um, in our 712. 
Um, the, the other piece, you will remember that we received the donation from Edson Bigford for the STEM lab. We had our first um, advisory committee meeting today. It was um, probably about 16 people around the table. We had four students. We had four faculty members. We had two community members. Uh, Burke, myself, uh, Steve Twitchell, and John C. L. I. Twinnick ran the meeting. Um, so we're moving forward with a vision. Uh, we had a student, Valerie Lee, who put together a pretty impressive visual of what the room will potentially look like. So more to come on that for you, but it's right. moving forward. So we're pretty excited about that. Burke? Um, my only update really would, would be um, related to our uh, Henry James project, just that I uh, was at the public building uh, committee meeting last week, and they were the, the first to uh, uh, give their formal okay to the plans and uh, specifications that you're going to hear more about shortly. So that, that's my only update. Thank you so much. Matt? Two things. Uh, we are going to be diving into a bu bit of a budget overview tonight, but I do want to just take a minute and talk about what, what's been in, you know, headline news, and that is uh, districts like ours receiving current year cuts in the educational cost share grant. That's something that ha hasn't happened in many, many years. Um, it is of significance, not only for this year, but I think more importantly, as I'll talk about in my budget overview, for next year. Um, you know, it's a rare practice to have districts try to adjust their revenues at this time of the year. Um, so a couple things, because there are some misconceptions often around the educational cost share grant. Those revenues, like any other town aid, go directly to the town. Uh, those revenues are used to offset the mill rate when we go into the budget process. Those dollars don't come directly to the Board of Ed uh, for us to allocate to, the, to various line items. Uh, so if there is a reduction to those in current year, it doesn't mean the automatic practice is that our operating budget uh, is reduced immediately by $145,000. I think it is prudent, and, and we'll talk later about different ways we can um, look to save, look to be really frugal in this current year to free funds up. Uh, for next year, we'll talk about that a little bit because uh, my feeling is with the governor coming out and talking about the court case, talking about the, the realization there will be a new funding formula in place for next year, um, I don't think the feeling around the table is that that funding formula will be advantageous for a community like ours. So I think we're going to have to be ready for, uh, you know, different news as that comes down and the timeliness of it, I'm, I'm not sure at this point. So I did want to... Uh, talk about that a little bit. I updated the board on that in my Friday update and wanted to, to talk through that in public a little bit. My second piece is much more of a feel good. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, in your folders, in each of your folders is, is a letter. And I know you won't have time to look through that letter now, but I want to give a little context and a little background uh, to it. Uh, we have a letter in, in the folders from uh, Fred Ostern, and Fred actually happens to be here tonight. I haven't met Fred, but I've talked to Fred on the phone because Fred's son Jake is going to participate in our, our presentation tonight, which is going to be uh, great. But I've had some conversations uh, uh, with Fred about uh, many of our staff members, the impact, the positive impact of our staff uh, over time in, in special services, uh, but most notably, Mr. Spector, who's here tonight, too, so this is really a feel-good. <laughs> and Fred actually took the time to write a really nice letter uh, about those experiences and kind of a testament uh, not only to Matt uh, for the great work he does, but the impact that other teachers have had with their dedication and commitment uh, to working with uh, Jake over the years uh, and seeing him become so successful. So uh, I encourage you to, to take some time to read that letter. Fred and I have talked about an award that uh, the Board of Ed honors on an annual basis. It's the Chamber of Commerce Education of the Year Award. Uh, and I would just mention that Fred has been enthusiastic, that's a good <laughs> word, enthusiastic about the prospects of having Matt considered for that award. And I think Matt would certainly be a great candidate for that. So Fred, thank you for taking the time. It's really nice uh, to see that. And I know the Board will uh, give that a read because uh, it's a bucket filler for sure. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'd like to thank Terrafield School for their gorgeous Christmas cards that they sent all of us on the Board of Edge, which was very sweet. They are so kind, wishing you a winter full of every joy. Seasons greetings from Terrafield School. So I thought that was very sweet of them to think of us, and um, we appreciate that very much. Um, for board members, there is a uh, correct legislative breakfast that we have. They have every year. It will be January 26th. If anyone's interested in going, please let us know. Me, Katie, anyone?
who has option to get tickets or let just so that they know we're coming um, it's a good thing to go it's a great opportunity for us to see our legislators and to talk about some of the stuff that is important to our district going forward um, uh, Emily mentioned the Martin Luther King event that will be on uh, Monday and it's open and free to everyone at the Congregational Church downtown Simsbury as she mentioned we'll have Simsbury participation but um, we also have Jolie Rock Brown who is a jazz musician and very well known and she's outrageously wonderful and she sings spirituals and she's being she has uh, communicated spirituals into jazz and we'll be singing a couple songs and we have Greg Jones will be um, speaking to us on his experience um, and his experience uh, celebrating Martin Luther King. The title of his talk is Responsibility of Inheriting the Dream. So that should be interesting. Um, Matt Curtis will be reading a reading on that day, which is wonderful. And um, we have a lot of great participation in town. So it's a nice, it's a nice event. And uh, if anyone has time, um, please come, come and join us all. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you all very much for your very full conversations this morning, just getting into us this evening, getting into our meeting. Um, we will move on to recommended actions. We have the minutes of December 13 meeting. Mike Goldman was the only one absent. Move that we approve the minutes. Thank you, Tom. Second. Thank you, Sue. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Thank you very much. So the minutes pass. Approval of the final plans for the cost estimate for the Henry James renovation project, phase two. Okay. Um, good evening. I want to welcome uh, Jennifer Manjali from Castle Booze Associates and also joining us this evening is Freddie Karachev from uh, Castle Booze. Jennifer is going to give some visual uh, overview of the uh, phase two. It's been a month or so since you last revised the educational specifications. Um, so some of this will come back to you in, in, in uh, terms of what was added to the scope of uh, the phase two project, which has already been funded. And what we've handed out in your hard packets this evening is a, a, a very succinct timeline that just shows you kind of where this uh, this evening fits in on the, on the timeline of, of moving towards going out to bid on this project and getting um, approvals from the state. Uh, our next meeting is on February 1st. And um, also, we gave you a handout. It's a little more um, legible size of what we had sent in your electronic packet, which is a two-page cost estimate. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer and give, let her give an uh, overview of this phase and, and be able to answer questions that uh, you may have. Okay. So I'm here tonight um, to present the phase two project that we're looking for approval um, by the board so that we can go to the state and get their review and approval from them to go to bid. Um, we can't go to bid without those um, pieces in place. Um, to run through the scope of work here, um, we are continuing what was phase one. Um, in phase one, we did a fire protection at the main level corridor um, in the academic wing. And we uh, had new finishes, new flooring finishes, painted walls, new lockers, um, lighting, ceiling, all in that main level corridor. So now in phase two, we're doing the same thing upstairs in the academic corridor. That's one of the basic um, scopes here. Another item is to uh, provide an HVAC, a new HVAC system replacement of the original systems in the gymnasium that will provide dehumidification, air conditioning, um, and all the proper airflow for the gymnasium. Also associated with the project is creating what was the girls' locker room on this side, or what is right now. Turning that over, renovating that into some classroom spaces, and some handicapped accessible toilet rooms. Um, due to heavy use in this area, and there are no <coughs> handicapped accessible toilet rooms in this part of the building, um, except for back kind of behind the scenes in um, one of the, maybe back in the late 90s, um, there were bathrooms back here. But we're providing handicapped accessible bathrooms in three classrooms um, to use as swing space, probably health classrooms, and to help with what we foresee in the future in phase three that we're working on, when we renovate 
and, and do reconfiguration of science rooms, making existing science rooms the proper size of what we would anticipate today. There's some shuffling of classrooms and, and potentially losing some classrooms in the academic wing, and this helps offset that adjustment there. Um, so there's three classrooms here, and in order to move girls over to this side with the boys, there's a split between two locker rooms. Um, we will need to come up with a physical education office, which doesn't, there, there isn't one for each side, boys and girls, so we will need to make one over there. We looked at the original scope of providing a handicapped accessible toilet room for the nurse. However, doing that would increase the size of the existing toilet room in order to get all the clearances that we needed. And there, the nurse's suite was already, or the health um, suite, was already crammed for, for space and had accessibility and kept accessibility issues. Getting a stretcher in there, getting wheelchairs, providing maneuvering now was difficult. If we were to expand the bathroom, it would the bathroom would be better, but the rest of the suite would suffer further. So we actually looked at a redesign of the nurse's area, taking over two um, multi-user toilet rooms to enlarge the suite a bit and make it proper for um, accessibility, maneuvering clearances, provide the handicapped toilet that um, would be in that space. That is an alternate though, that because, of, because that scope of work grew from what we anticipated, um, that is actually listed as an alternate at the bottom of your, your handout. We're hoping to be able to get that work done in this project. We also are creating a unisex handicapped accessible toilet room in the main hallway because there is nothing right now for visitors as far that fits accessible. Um, when they were to, you know, if they were to come to the to the building, go to the administration or whatever, there's nowhere to direct them to a handicapped accessible toilet. So that's a renovated area. Um, also in the main hallway, right across from the office, we are proposing display cases um, to highlight the achievements of, of the Henry James students. So there are multiple display cases and display wall areas proposed as a part of this project right across from the main office, very visible when you come in the front entrance. There are also elevator upgrades, again for handicapped accessibility and due to the age there are some um, recommended improvements, so we're making those here. Um, and along with our finishes on the upper floor, we're also addressing the finishes um, in the stairwells as well. There's a couple of alternates associated with those. We looked at the prices of a couple of different finishes for the stairs. So face fit is a certain finish um, on the treads and on the landings. And then an alternate would be to even upgrade it to, to even a better finish that was that we discussed um, with Steve Twitchell, principal. <coughs> These are enlargements of the areas that I just spoke about. Um, this new area are the three classrooms, the multi-user toilet rooms, that renovation area, the, the boys' PE office that we're creating out of an existing room, the enlarged restroom, and the health suite nurses area and the Hall of uh, Achievement is, is down here. So um, that's the general scope of work. I, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, there are, um, as I mentioned before, there's lockers associated finishes um, in the upper level quarter as well. Sure. Is that the stairwell? This is a picture of one of the stairwells, yes. Okay, are we doing work to the stairwell? So in the stairwells, um, we are doing new finishes yeah. for the, the treads and the landings. Yep. Um, except for there's there's two stairs, two of the, these two stairs have um, a finish on the main level that actually is, is okay. durable. We have an alternate to, okay. to make a more uniform finish in there, but it's not absolutely necessary, so it's an alternate. But all the stair treads on the four stairs yeah. and the intermediate landings and the upper landings are all getting replaced That's as a part of this project. Yeah. And sprinkler protection in those stairs as well. We're also um, doing a little bit of lighting. These two stairs in particular are very dark. Yeah. Um, Great. We have the original light fixtures, so sure there's do. a couple light yep. fixtures for those. Okay. 
you, okay. you, um, you mentioned like the, the, the word that you used was alternates. Yes. Like, okay, so can you just help me understand kind of in the vernacular of? Sure. of okay. Um, the, the drawings that we have prepared, and, and there is a set back here. I believe the link was also sent to you. Um, drawings and specifications that we prepared for this project have this, this whole entire scope. And we hope that bids will come in favorable, of course. Um, if, um, when the contractors give us a price, they are actually going to give us some line items for some specific items, such as the nurse, for instance. No. It's um, listed as an ad alternate. So when we get that price for the nurse and we get the, the bid for the, the whole entire project, um, it'll be up to the district to decide, do they, is there enough money gotcha. to so do the nurse? So it's a line item, go, no, a go. Line item that we can go okay. with. So we have five right now, five alternates. Okay. Um, and, and then that decision can be made based on how pricing comes in. We hope to be able to do them all. Yeah. But if we can't, then there can be some picking and choosing based on the prices that we get. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The bathrooms that you mentioned yes. um, over by the Tech Ed Wing. Yes. So you said handicap, is it solely a handicap bathroom or it's a multi, it's for, you're going to have another boys and girls room essentially? We're going to have another multi-user boys and girls room. Um, there's actually five stalls in the, in the girls room planned okay. for, actually maybe it's good to look over here. Um, five stalls planned for the girls and then uh, five fixtures for, for the boys side. So they are multi-user toilet rooms. Okay. What they do, if the nurse alternate is chosen, though, the nurse takes over two toilet rooms right. that are multi-user. That's what I was way. wondering. I wanted to make sure that we still had bathrooms for the kids in Fair that way. way. Yeah. Yes. That it wasn't just. Right. So we are, in effect, replacing what we're taking away. And I think it's plus another fixture for okay. each each side. But the ones that, that are there now, where mm -hmm. the, the nurse would hopefully be taking them over, um, they aren't at all handicapped accessible. They're right. they're pretty old. They're I've been in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're original. Yeah. Just be on that. And they're original. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and these bathrooms would see a lot of use, even from from public and after hours. Being yeah. that the gym is there, the cafeteria is there. Right. Those are highly used. Sure. It's a highly trafficked area. Yeah. It would be good to have handicapped accessible bathrooms. Well, we use those building those those gyms for public access as well, Absolutely. more than just school. You know, I mean, it's right. a public building, so yeah, it's for so it would right. be for anyone who would yeah. need it. Right. Constant use. So I so I also wanted to just comment that so as a, as a part of this process, this uh, the state well the state has to give the blessing to go out to bid. The actual review of the plans is now a local review process. So um, we've had meetings, uh, Jennifer and, and Brian and I with um, Kevin uh, Kowalski as the Farm Marshal and also Henry Mega, our town building inspector. So they have seen these plans. There's been some give and take. I think we'll chat just a little bit about some of you know some of those aspects. Um, and then as a uh, part of the, the process, we expect them to uh, give a give a formal sign off hopefully this week also, in in getting ready to go out to uh, bid. The cost estimate that's um, in your packet, uh, two million four hundred sixty-five thousand is the is the total cost. And as the board may. Um, Recall, we, we, we actually added two sources of funding, and, and uh, the state uh, put this on the uh, priority B list for um, for the uh, upcoming uh, grant grant process. And this is a little different than the first floor in terms of the fire protection process because the, the we found that uh, as, as they um, did the plans and plans and uh, specifications the main sprinkler line on the first floor is right in the you know right in the ceiling that's not possible on this on the second floor so there's been some uh, back and forth and I'll let Jennifer speak um, a bit about how that how that's um, being planned currently um, the existing ceiling on the second floor is is eight feet now for this this whole length. Um, and this eight foot ceiling doesn't have room in it for the main, the sprinkler main that would need to go through here to sprinkler and protect the corridors and ultimately stub off and go into all the classrooms, offices, the rest of, of this floor. But in Just this phase. Just plan for phase three. Gotcha, yeah. Right. In this phase, it was originally just the quarter, like in downstairs, it was just in phase one, it was just the quarter. Um, because the main won't fit 
in this ceiling area, even though we are putting a new ceiling back, um, we don't want to lower it lower than eight feet. There's also um, borrowed lights or like windows between classrooms and corridor now that go all the way up to eight feet, and we don't want to drop that ceiling below that, that window line. So we're actually running two mains, and they're running parallel with the corridor, um, running through the classrooms, which are um, have exposed structure right now. These classrooms don't generally have ceilings. Um, so the sprinkler pipe will run parallel and come into the corridor every now and then to provide protection for the corridor. When we ran that by the fire marshal, he had no concerns really with um, the way we were routing the piping and providing protection from the corridor, for the corridors. But he suggested that we put an alternate on the project to see what the price would be now to provide protection for the classrooms because we're right there. We were planning on doing that, hopefully in phase three, sprinkling the whole entire building. Um, but since we're running the mains through the classrooms, we're right there, it would be possibly more cost effective to do now. So he wanted that alternate. Um, so we get a price and see, is it better to do that now? But we do need to be cognizant of what could be coming in phase three, which is some reconfiguration which would adjust some of those sprinkler lines. We don't want to have to undo something um, in phase three that we just are doing in phase three. So we're, we're trying to figure that out. Do you, do you want me to go? No, I think that's fine. And we're, we're just we're, we're looking, to get the, looking to get the sign-offs, and then we'll, we'll relay where we're at. We'll have that price, and we'll figure out where we're at at, this, at that point in time. Burke, any financial surprises or any, you know, as you're going through this process, were there any sort of uh, challenges from that perspective? Um, I mean, we, we, we added to the scope um, by trying to do the swing space classrooms that weren't, uh, that, that's something that you added to the, to the um, educational uh, specifications and the concept of, of adding the HVAC um, after our last meeting with the state about six six weeks or so ago, maybe two months ago now, um, we were pleased to, to, to hear that part of the, you know, part of the HVAC work would be reimbursable. So that was the logic in, in, in adding this. So we know we're, um, you know, we started at, a, at a, a smaller scope. We're now at a little bit larger scope. I'm hopeful that, that we'll be able to do most of the alternates. I'm not thinking that, you know, that those are a, a given by any stretch, but it's, it made sense to put them in, see how the bids, um, um, Come in, and I think um, Jennifer can just you know briefly explain the ineligible cost estimate versus the eligible cost. Um, the you have the estimate. Um, uh, there's a portion of the work that is not eligible for reimbursement. Typically, things that are not eligible for reimbursement are repair and replacement type of type of work. So the biggest chunk of ineligible work here in this phase is actually associated with the gymnasium HVAC unit. Because in effect, you're replacing something yep. that was there. They only have a certain lifespan, and the state wants districts to plan for replacement and repair of such things. Um, they don't typically reimburse that. However, we do get some reimbursement for that work because we are adding features that the existing one does not have. Air conditioning isn't there now, so when we put air conditioning in, we actually get reimbursement for the air conditioning, and we get reimbursement for the dehumidification. Um, but most of it is not reimbursed, and that's a big chunk of the 698000 that we estimate, which is in the upper right-hand corner of your sheet, and it's ineligible. Um, so that includes much of the, the gymnasium, gymnasium HVAC. Other items that are not eligible for reimbursement are um, some of the finishes. Um, in the finishes and lockers up in the corridor. Um, some of it is eligible, some isn't. When there is actually, if there's asbestos um, associated underneath the existing flooring, because the state wants to take care of hazardous materials and they reimburse for that, we actually get some of the new replacement flooring reimbursed um, and some of the new lockers reimbursed as well. 
where we're enlarging the, the nurses area, where we're providing handicapped toilet rooms, things like that are always eligible. So that's a good thing. Um, if things are required programmatically or for ADA purposes, those are eligible for reimbursement. Yeah. Any questions about eligibility um, or the estimate? So at this point in time, you need us to approve what we see in front of us right. as we move forward to the other pieces that need to be approved by other people. Correct. Okay. This is this is a step in uh, step in the process. This will allow us to state <laughs> and to advertise and and uh, as you see from this timeline, you know, what the hope would be to to, to uh, award a, a contract later um, in or around the first week in April. So we can get moving on. Mobilize and, and when school's out, this can you know, great bulk of this work would be summer, a little bit would be into the fall. Thank you. The sooner we get it done, the better, of course. All right, I'll uh, I'll make a motion unless anyone has any. I'll move that the Board of Ed approves the final plans and project manual as prepared for bidding along with the professional cost estimate for the Henry James renovation project phase two. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for Appreciate all your help. You. Just once or twice. Once or twice. <laughs> once. I did write it down. <laughs> Katie pointed at me. I was kind of on it, but then she really pulled it. She knew covers. Well, thank you all very much. That's an exciting opportunity that is definitely Long needed. Overdue. Long right. overdue. Long overdue. Mm -hmm. It'll be great to get that place up. Um, okay, moving on. Information and reports. The 2017-2018 budget overview. All right, so it's the big kickoff of the, the season where we get to talk about uh, budget for the next couple months, I guess. Are you trying to be excited? I am trying to get excited about the time. <laughs> to kick off with excitement. You know? Um, so tonight what I really want to do is just provide uh, kind of a high-level overview, really talk about context more than anything else. I think it's really important for us to be on the same page in terms of some of the contextual factors we're dealing with and provide just some basic financial information uh, on what we know now, some of the knowns in a familiar format, and then some of the things we're considering and having conversations about and we'll come forward and talk to you about uh, starting tonight with Sue's presentation and then in, in subsequent weeks. So the first piece of information is something that we, we show publicly, and those are our audited numbers on per pupil expenditure. Uh, this is a, a number that often gets ranked, it gets analyzed. We have quite a bit of conversation on an annual basis uh, with the Board of Finance about these numbers. So I put up last year's, uh, remember this is lag data, so it's always a year behind. Last year's 2014-15 uh, data uh, and the respective per pupil expenditure kind of rankings, where we sit uh, amongst uh, the state. There's about 170 some odd districts where last year we were 100th. This year, while our expenditure went up due to the decline in enrollment, um, you see that our relative ranking improved a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we, we stay pretty steady with that. Within the DERG, 12th last year, 13th this year. Rankin Hartford, 11th last year, 12th this year. So kind of holding steady on that front. That's a statistic that's, quite honestly, we've talked about. It's been more challenging to uh, control relative to the significant decline we've seen in enrollment, enrollment decline a little steeper than some comparative communities. Uh, I put it at the bottom at that same time, kind of the, the last four years, where we've been with overall budget increases with a note that we've really worked hard collectively and collaboratively uh, to get that mill, that flat mill rate over the course of the last couple years. And I think we've, we've done a, a real good job with that. We've done that with creating some program enhancements, not hurting program, really adding some resources, so we'll talk about them tonight, to special services that we needed. Uh, so collectively, we moved the district forward and kind of met that target that the Board of Finance and the community had with uh, really being cognizant, cognizant about taxes. Enrollment, Neil talked about enrollment in our last uh, presentation, so I'm not going to dig too deeply into it other than to say we continue to see the, the downward trend in enrollment. It will be now at the secondary level much more. We're evening off at the elementary level, so you'll see that next year we're projected to have a decline of 70 four students, 69 of those students are 712. 
Uh, when you look at the five-year history, it's pretty significant, a 400 student decline. Another reason why we've been able to attain those uh, minimal budget increases is because we've kind of coined that phrase, responsible reductions of, of staff along the way, enrollment related reductions. We have a responsibility to continue to uh, look at our class size and ensure that we're within those guidelines. We're going to talk about that a little bit as we, we move forward. So to go back and revisit the three board meeting a little bit to help us shape the context, and, and I put some other factors in there as well. Remember that three board meeting, we get together with the Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen, our Board of Ed. We had really good representation at that meeting. Uh, the purpose of that meeting is to talk through uh, various factors and provide us guidance for our, our planning process. Uh, this year was interesting. They had a new modeling tool that they, they worked us through. Barbara Pettigene at the time, it was her last meeting, worked us through the model. Uh, Linda Schofield has chaired uh, a committee, a long-range planning committee. Both Todd and Mike sit on that committee. I think there's a lot of useful data and information that we've put together that will help us kind of look at our fixed costs and trends over time and help us to accomplish our educational goals and get people on the same page. Uh, so we had a, a bit of a tutorial there. Uh, and in the end, they talked about uh, a guideline in the area of, of 2%. I mean, this wasn't a fixed guideline. It wasn't a fixed cap. But that was kind of the consensus uh, of the group, something for us to think about. Uh, some other things that they talked about and we need to be thinking about. Ooh, head back for a minute, Sue. So, sorry. Um, the state deficit, uh, both current year, we talked about the ECS funding and the reduction and moving forward in future years. So um, the best way I can kind of frame that as we move into the budget season is that lingers, right? I mean, it, it, it's hard for us to grapple with a little bit because the timing of it we don't know. We can't quantify it, uh, but we know that it, 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 it's a factor out there we need to be really cognizant of and need to be looking closely at things and have kind of plans, I think, to adjust to different scenarios maybe a little more thoroughly than we have in the past. I think that's just the reality of where we are. Uh, loss of tax revenue from the Hartford facility. Now the Board of Finance is, has planned for this thoughtfully uh, with allocating reserves to offset that. Um, but those factors we recognize along with the fact that the grand list growth will take time to balance out. There's a lot of new building in town, a lot of new build outs. Um, they haven't hit the ta they haven't hit the rolls yet. So that'll take time to catch up, make up the deficit from the Hartford. So when we look at all those things, I mean, the, the Board of Finance realizes this isn't the year with fixed costs being what they are, and I'll, I'll, I'll show them to you in a minute where we can obtain, it's a realistic goal to attain a flat, a flat mill rate. You know, that wasn't the kind of will of the group. Uh, so that's important to note. Um, class size analysis, the Board of Finance brought this up, our own Board of member, uh, Ed members brought this up in, in previous conversations. So uh, it's important that we take a hard, hard look. We do on an annual basis to ensure that we're staffed within guidelines, uh, but now that that uh, decline has hit the high school, we need to take a look at the, some of these smaller elective offerings. We need to have conversations uh, about what we're uh, willing to run and, and not run if things get extremely tight. So uh, Neil has started already. We've met on a couple occasions. He's, he's uh, kind of got the reins for the meeting at the end of uh, January to really give us a deep dive into this and show us what class size uh, scenarios will look like, actual numbers will look like via different kind of enrollment related reductions. And I think it's important we do that work uh, early and upfront and then we kind of come to a consensus on uh, an FTE number that we feel we can uh, potentially take off the back end. Uh, I mentioned the enrollment already, but those are, that, that basically shapes the context of what we're dealing in. Uh, and I think we're on, we're on point with that and on the same page. Um, just to talk through the numbers a little bit, um, this is a slide we've kind of gotten used to the format of and we carry it out through the entire budget process. Um, talking about main drivers, right, fixed costs at this point. So when we look at the additions and we kind of take into account those first uh, one, two, four, four line items, they're all contract related. Um, many of them contracts that are already negotiated and fixed costs, including our largest contract, which is our teacher contract. Um, which alone, if we move the organization forward at the same size, um, creates a budget overall increase of 1.52 or over a million dollars. Um, significant, but not unlike we've seen in the past, not unlike our, our current year that we're sitting in right now. Um, we look at the other various contracts, and now we're a little bit above two, about a 2.1. Uh, the other major driver in there I'd like to, to talk about for a few minutes tonight uh, is the health insurance. 
Um, you see a pretty significant increase there of over a million dollars, another 1.53% uh, to the budget, a little bit of other insurance uh, added in, and you can see the fixed costs. Is it about, what do we have, about a 3.7, 3.69. So um, I would say that we're not in the comfort zone of where we usually start. Uh, in terms of having these conversations, and I think it's important to say that. It's important to know that we have a lot of information to review, uh, a lot of conversations to have, uh, but again, important to know what it looks like when we roll the organization forward. And I'll speak to insurance a little bit in a minute. The only reduction I've taken at this point is certified staff retirements. Uh, we have six retirements known at this time, so what that number is, you've become familiar with that. Uh, it's kind of the exiting top end salary of a teacher and the assumption that we may hire a teacher in the middle of the scale. So it's a ballpark figure, uh, some realized savings as we work through, um, about $150,000, which puts us uh, in the mid threes. Um, often at this time of the year, what I'll do is I'll put up the enrollment related reduction already to show you it is, but I think it's important we go through that process together this year in a little bit more detail. Uh, there will be, I wanna make clear though, there will be enrollment related reductions that aren't program that aren't impacting program in a negative way. Uh, I just think that this year with the conversation and the scrutiny, it's important that we put out a little bit of an extra layer of detail to show you what those numbers actually look like in terms of class size impact. All right, um, so to give some perspective to the insurance, because that's a, that's a pretty large number and when it stands alone, you don't have any comparable data there. That is a, an increase unlike we've seen um, in recent years. Uh, in self-insurance overall, you can see that top bullet has been very favorable for many years. And I don't want to say that that skews uh, reality a little bit, but we've had very fortunate experience within our internal service fund. Um, we've had uh, really successful collaborative uh, negotiations with our bargaining groups and transitions to new types of plans. We had a plan consolidation uh, several years ago with the town to a carrier that all created significant savings and surplus in our internal service fund, which in essence allowed us to utilize those funds to offset the insurance increase. Um, a lot of technical jargon, but essentially we really helped to minimize the overall impact of our insurance, or of our budget increases over the past several years by mitigating the insurance line item, uh, in some cases to uh, next to nothing. You can see the, an important bullet there, third bullet down, that the Board of Finance um, several years ago transferred $3 million from the Internal Service Fund uh, into the OPEP Fund. It was a, kind of a strategic recommendation uh, of the Board, Peter Askham in particular, uh, in consultation with Bob Lindbergh, our insurance advisor. We had a fund at the time that had uh, an inflated balance, a balance that they weren't comfortable uh, carrying, and we've certainly benefited from putting those dollars towards OPEP. It also restricts our flexibility because it lowers the amount in the internal service fund to be able to re react to volatility. Okay, so uh, the last factor I'll talk about a little bit is that the first five months of this year, claims are significantly higher, up about 20% to the tune of about a million dollars, kind of when you look at raw numbers. So as a result, in our initial meeting, which took place today, believe it or not, with uh, so the wounds are fresh. The wounds are fresh. The wounds are fresh. <laughs> Mr. Lindbergh is recommending a 15% increase. Uh, we're hopeful that we will have some movement in that number, but I have to be honest, it will not be movement like we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, and I want to put that number out there early because I think there will be conversation with the Board of Finance. The town is in the absolute same situation we are because it's a, a, joint, a joint situation. Um, so as we work through our budget process, this is the beginning of our public conversations, but behind the scenes we have individual meetings uh, with each of our building principals, go through their priorities, uh, really take a look at, at various different categories. Um, there are three kind of main pieces that are staff related that have surfaced um, that we'd like to support in conversation um, as we present to you and go through the budget process. One is an additional social worker. We added one last year, you'll remember. We've seen tremendous benefit. Um, we have talked about with the challenges we deal with um, an interest in potentially bringing in another social worker on board. Um, Susan talked about the math implementation pilot. We know the significance of it. 
another professional math expert, a coach to really help with that transition, working with teachers in the classroom, boots close to the ground. We've seen the impact of that. Uh, and so principals have, have really advocated for that. And the new schedule um, creates some staffing needs, although not significant. But when you add it up with the context that we're talking about, uh, you can see it's over $300,000, add another almost half a percent to the operating budget. So principals are aware. Our team certainly has had conversation, knowing that any new position that's added is going to have to be an offset to the overall FTE and, and the attrition that we're looking at. And we certainly think we can accomplish that. Uh, it's just a matter of how this evolves uh, in, the, in the targeted number that we're trying to, to drive for relative to how much staff we can really uh, bring on board or not. So some of the, the conversations um, we've started to have internally here and we'll be presenting to the board and, and the Board of Finance as we move through. I referenced that class size analysis with Neil. Uh, he'll be bringing that forward next year, uh, next uh, meeting. Uh, the non-lapsing account, really a vehicle that has helped us over the course of the past three years. Uh, one thing to really think about here is tighten current year spending in lieu of the fact that we've already been uh, the revenue has been tapped by the town for $146,000. Really looking across line items, uh, looking across different vacancies that occur current year, see if you can free up savings in the current year to ensure at the end of the year that you have as many dollars you can in that non-lapsing account to utilize for the out year. Uh, it's something we've done in the past. It's something I think we need to pay even more attention to now because it can offer us flexibility, particularly hopefully on the insurance front. Uh, we hope to see, as I said, some in insurance premium uh, flexibility. We'll have to monitor that as we move throughout. Equipment is a line item that goes zero base every year. It's need based. Uh, we look at all of our um, equipment requests from our principals. We evaluate them. We make a judgment on where we are in the overall operating budget as to how much we can allocate on an annual basis. It's always a place where we can hold or not full, you know, hold or, or not and, and, and make really strategic judgments. So I think that's a place we'll probably in a workshop environment have some detailed conversation on uh, how much equipment, if any, uh, is needed in a budget that, that could be extremely tight. 4% uh, per open choice enrollment. Um, in earlier conversations at the board, we talked, uh, started to initiate conversation about the open choice program. Uh, we're one of the founding districts of the program, believe strongly in the foundational values of the program. We are in a situation where we are incredibly close uh, in student enrollment to hitting a 4% threshold that would free up close to $400,000 of revenue for us that could potentially be used as an offset as well. So I think that's something the board, uh, myself and my team need to talk about uh, in public session, and Neil will include that as part of his um, conversation and review on enrollment. Other areas that we're still taking a look at, uh, professional development. I was actually really excited to see our principals come to the table and with, with really innovative professional development ideas. Of course, that increases cost, uh, which doesn't always increase excitement, but it's something that we need to really think about and vet and make priority judgments about. Uh, because if this is the direction our leaders want to go in, we may need to make some decisions in other areas to allow that work to move forward. So we're having those conversations now. Uh, technology is another area that's a, a significant line item that we will be taking a look at. Uh, textbooks in lieu of the math implementation. We know there's a one-time pretty significant buy-up cost. Aaron's doing some great analysis right now in current year um, and in prioritization to see what we can do to not really alter that line item in the current year. Uh, so we don't see a spike, but that's going to take some creativity and some, some conversation with the board as well. Uh, equipment, as I said, and then instructional supplies. These are kind of main buckets we can go to uh, to both see where we are currently and see what kind of flexibility we have when we know we have a number that starts in the mid threes that we have to, um, isn't going to be palatable, I don't think, for this board, quite honestly, or, or the Board of Finance. So um, that's where we are at this point. Kind of a highlight, we can take any any questions that you, you do have. And of course, Sue and her team are here tonight to both kick off the program review and talk about uh, budget implications a little bit as well. Anyone have any comments? Uh, questions? I have a question. Like, usually when you give us the known drivers, you kind of yep. then also say, okay, here are some of the larger unknowns. Um, 
any sense of either positive or negative kind of unknowns that are out there hanging or kind of too early to tell and we'll get to that? I, I think we'll get to a little bit more of it. Nothing significant. I mean, for, for us, I think it's it's going to be a hard analysis of, uh, of staffing with program conversations, you know. So if you want to bucket something into the unknowns the that can have the impact for numbers either up, either up or down, yeah. uh, it's where we sit with things we'd like to do in the reality of maybe priority prioritizing things we can do in lieu of the enrollment drop. So that would be the biggest. The OPEB piece is always yeah. an unknown that comes right. in much later. It's yeah. just too early in the game okay. uh, gotcha. for us to have really hard data on that. Okay. Anyone else? The six known retirements. Those, yes. So those are your known retirements. Sometimes you'll lay it out where this is what we'd like to have and then reduce that number. That's not part of this. Right. We have six so there are, yeah, great question. So there, those are the retirements, those are known. So yeah. that's assuming we're rehiring all those positions. Okay. All right. There are no other additional in what I demonstrated tonight, staffing reductions. It's rolling forward the organization as is. Okay. We will be able to reduce some full full time equivalent positions without impacting going over guidelines. I just wanted to do a much more thorough dive of that with you so we can see collectively what that looks like, okay. what maybe that next layer looks like. Yep. Okay. Um, rather than just start off and say we're taking four, because I think when we say that, people don't understand what the impact that is sometimes right. to, okay, so what did, how did that change the dynamics of certain classes? Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. That was uh, as painless as it's going to be, but thank you. Neil's going to be busy. Neil's going to be, I, think, I think we're all going to be busy. There'll be a lot of pieces to this that need to be addressed, but I appreciate that you're being so, um, you're willing to work hard and look deep and see where we can do it correctly and be thoughtful about all of this. It's really important. And thank you, Burke, as well. Um, and now here is Ms. Lepke. Hi, everyone. So I just want to point out that it's not a rain effect on a PowerPoint. That's an issue with our projector, so it shouldn't show up like that on your screens. We can't afford a new one. I wasn't <laughs> trying to do anything fancy with rainfall effects is what I wanted to point out there. But it's always um, a treat to come in and share with the board around our passions for special education and our stu supporting our students with identified disabilities. Tonight, Nancy Forsberg, District Department Supervisor, uh, is going, she and I, will be reviewing uh, elements of our special education program. We'll be revisiting our mission statement that was just revised, as you might remember. Talk about ways in which we've made that mission statement hopefully very palpable for our staff members. We'll also be sharing with you some student performance data. How are our students doing on SBAC measures, CAPT, CMT, SAT? How are we doing relative to our DERG, relative to overall our students in Simsbury? Um, and then we'll also be uh, highlighting some performance, Simsbury's performance, relative to the Connecticut performance plan um, and the special education measures that that performance plan looks at. Uh, we will then go into some budget considerations, reminding the board of your incredible support of special ed, specifically in staffing, share with you the new request that Matt touched upon regarding our elementary social worker, and then finally, sharing with you three areas of volatility as far as financial forecasting. Um, those include out-of-district placements, transportation, and I'm going to highlight on our birth to three components and how um, some of those unknowns add to the complexity of our ability to uh, forecast and staff accordingly. Uh, finally, we'll end with a department update. You have I've heard about the big five before, so I'll just give you um, an update on our work there. Certainly share with you some exciting changes in our leadership team. And then finally add, last year I shared with you some vignettes of our work across the district. And tonight I've brought three guests to highlight two examples of the many of the great work that's occurring in special education in Simsbury. So uh, this is just to orient us all. We're always keeping the student at the center of what we do, specifically in special education with individualized education plans. But that support doesn't happen without incredible faculty and staff. Certainly, uh, Matt uh, talked a, a little bit about Matt Spector, uh, but I have many Matt Spectors uh, as well as an incredible teachers on, on our teaching staff and our support staff. Um, our families are incredible here and are 
wonderful partners as we provide the supports necessary to make sure that our students are succeeding here in Simsbury. And our overall community is just extremely um, uh, supportive of our efforts and help us in many ways, shapes, and forms, and we'll touch upon that as well. So just to highlight, once again, the mission statement, which was um, revamped last year in a very collaborative process with both staff, uh, community members, and parents, and just want to highlight um, some really, I think, important words of partnership, specialized instruction, meaningful relationships, support, passion, potential, independence, and achievement. And certainly, we hope to touch on all those aspects tonight. Well, thank you for letting me participate in the board meeting uh, this evening. Um, just give you a, a glimpse of how we started the year uh, in, in, uh, in our program. We, uh, over the summer, found a book called One Word. <laughs> and this is probably a really great time where all of us have uh, probably laid out those great New Year's resolutions that we'll probably not all succeed on. <laughs> and that's kind of what the, the book talked mm -hmm. about, is picking one word, one focus, one thing to think about. And for every person in the department, it's a little bit different because they're on a little bit different journey, whether it's their role or how long they've been with their district or the students they're serving. So one of the things Sue and I tasked them to do was come up with one word that was going to be something that they were going to be reflective of during the year to revisit that, to refocus them when things got challenging or when things were great to think about that one word. So they, we took that one word and we all wrote them on um, rocks. Um, so I brought mine tonight. My word for the year is discover. As a new employee, that's one of the things I was really excited about doing is discovering all of the talents, discovering the challenges, and discovering the resources that we had within ourselves to face those challenges. And so that was part of the work. We created a, a Wordle from all of the, the different words that the, the teachers and staff brought forth. So this is one of, I don't know if you've ever used Wordle, but uh -huh. you can make it look like all different things. So this is just one, just to give you a sample of some of the words that the staff come up and think about um, on a regular basis. Sue talked a little bit about um, achievement issues and reporting data. So this slide kind of encapsulates a lot of the information that you could see in a lot of different graphs, but puts it all in kind of one form. Um, kind of talk about in the, the testing data. And this looks at um, how our students are performing on these assessments in comparison to um, our DERG and in comparison to ourselves. So I think what's worth noting is seeing, well, with our DERG, we've got some really great celebrations to talk about uh, at the elementary level, looking at the science, secondary level, looking at the math. And then we've got some challenges with, with the math, uh, sorry, the science and, the, um, science and math at the secondary. And then the math at the elementary level is struggling a little bit more. So that's something that we're looking both at uh, in special services and the district as a whole. The district as a whole is, is struggling a little bit with the math. Um, at the elementary level. I think the, um, the other important piece to look at is to understand that if students are in special ed, there is going to be an achievement gap, otherwise they wouldn't be receiving specialized services in some areas. But given that, there's still some things we want to make sure that we're looking at, and that's that last column is when we're, we're looking at how students overall are performing and then where we're we're performing at or above the goal level, we need to make sure that we're constantly challenging ourselves, make sure we're making sure the kids are meeting their goals on their IEPs and the goals for meeting their grade level peers as well. So that kind of encapsulates the overall picture there. When Nancy discusses more about the achievement gap, one of the big five measures, she'll be right. discussing um, some very intentional steps we've taken to address some of the uh, student performance data concerns. And then as Matt said earlier, sometimes when we get feedback from the state, it's not within the year that we're dealing with. This is data that we've gotten back from the state level on how we've been reporting. So we did some really nice work in the 14-15 school year of being in compliance with all of our evaluation timelines, which is really big to make sure that we're serving our students well that when we look at our, our individual school and the district as a whole, we're in alignment with uh, our percentage of students who are receiving um, specialized services, that we're making sure that all of our transitions, whether they're work, school, they're all in line, 
and that our data submission when we're reporting to the state, all of that has been in a timely manner and within state expectations. So that was great. And there are many expectations around our data submission. Um, they're continuously asking us for different elements of data. Um, what I do want to share with the board is that I've seen a, a different level mm -hmm. of intentionality about looking at what data they're asking us to give them and explaining why. I haven't seen the benefit of feeling a relief from that yet, <laughs> but at least they're looking at it. and I. That I appreciate, and that's so you, been different. You give credit for at least explaining the rationale. I do. I actually do um, because I had some questions about that. So because hopefully, we're in special ed, where I was looking for the good. <laughs> so more on that. Um, budget considerations. You know, I, I want to start off with doing a comparison of special ed enrollment versus general ed enrollment, and this is a four-year look back from 2013 to 2014 and current year. What I want to note uh, to the board, certainly we are experiencing a decrease in enrollment and that bottom number is our October 1 number minus our identified students in special ed. So we do have a decrease, it's of 259 students over this four year period, but we're still experiencing an increase in special education. So we have an additional 30 students identified from that period of 2013, 2014 until now. Now, kind of reflecting upon uh, Nancy's comments, uh, these I increases are not out of whack to what we're seeing across the state. Uh, when I'm speaking to my colleagues, this is a very similar story, but I wanted to give you some specifics here in Simsbury because that special ed enrollment has really driven um, many of the staffing requests that the board has supported in the past couple of years, certainly within my tenure here. So these are just some highlights of staffing support of special ed, uh, anywhere from uh, certified staff, uh, paraeducator supports, uh, a BCBA. Last year, you'll remember um, presenting to the board uh, had really highlighted uh, the students who are becoming older, who have very intense needs, and who were at the yes uh, last year's at the doorstep of the high school, and they're now ninth graders there. So with your support, we added. Uh, a number of staff members to the high school and that is going very very well appropriate staffing uh, for the needs across the district I'm going to come back to these unanticipated pre-k para needs because those are directly related to some of the volatility regarding our birth to three so I'm going to circle back to those those and were initially in the budget presentation last year but have certainly come up as a need um, as Matt mentioned, there is, specific to special ed, a request for an elementary social worker. Uh, this was a unanimous request among all of our elementary school principals, five. You know, certainly we have right now two elementary social workers. One is Christine Golden and the other is Erin Naspo. And they're doing incredible work within the district. And I know that our principals, our teachers, our students and our families are really recognizing the value added of those positions in their work, really to be able to address some of the complexities in connecting families with resources, and not only for our identified students, for, for some of our general education students and families as well. So that is the one staffing request relative to special ed for the 17-18 school year. Uh, other department factors to consider, these are, you know, in my opening comments, I mentioned the three areas of greater volatility in special education financial forecasting. You know, first are out of district placements. Um, currently, we are projected to spend $2.6 million in our out of district placements. Uh, what I will share with the board is um, in the past two years, we've seen a decrease in the number of students placed out of district. That tells me, and in really looking at that with our team members, bringing back students into district who should be appropriately here because um, in district is their least restrictive environment. Those 21 students who are there are students who need to be outplaced um, because their needs can't be met within the Simsbury Public Schools at this time. Um, however, even though we've seen a decrease in the number of those outplacements, the tuitions associated with those outplacements come at a greater cost. And that is why you're going to see the projected spike um, from where we ended up in actuality last year, 15-16. 
In addition, related to those out-of-district placements is the transportation of those students, by and large, associated with those out-of-district placements. So this year we're projected to be at 1.3 million. Um, Burke and I meet on a weekly basis to talk about all of these volatile factors, to really certainly keep an eye on them. We're always trying to maximize efficiencies, whether that be sharing routes with other districts, trying to uh, maximize our, um, you know, our costs in different ways, and we're continuing to look at transportation as one of those volatile measures. Finally, birth to three. And I just wanted to do kind of a, a brief um, history on birth to three and what that, how that really lives here in Simsbury. There are a number, dozens, of birth to three agencies and providers. And um, there is a lot of inconsistency within those providers. Um, with that, I will share with you that birth to three is really driven by a student's birth date. When do they turn three? When do they come in on the calendar year? It's not, hey, all students who are three by September are in for this year. It's almost like a rolling admissions. And again, it's based on birth date. Um, six months out from those birth dates, we receive, hey, Six months from now, you're going to be receiving three kids, um, and here are their birth dates. Here's when you can be expecting them. And what happens during that time, um, around that three-month mark, we have a service plan that happens with all students who are identified in that birth to three process, and we have a transition meeting from that service plan to a potential IEP. At that three months out, if we're invited, and typically we are, although sometimes we don't know. Um, that I really have to give kudos to Leah Co, who functions both as department supervisor at preschool as well as a preschool teacher. She and her team do an incredible amount of legwork reaching out to these agencies to say, hey, we're here. We want to partner with you. Most importantly, we want to make this transition out of birth to three and into the public schools a smooth one. But it's really not until three months out that we learn as a team uh, the nature of a child's disability, the complexity and intensity. So I may, again, have three students coming in three months from now. One student may require 30 minutes of speech a week. And another student may require um, a one-to-one -one paraeducator to help support facilitation because of some intense needs. Coming back to that 1.6, um, those are that staffing that will be coming up in February, March, and April because we have three very intense uh, students with intense needs <coughs> who will be joining us in the Simsbury Public Schools. So again, I point that out to you because we couldn't have forecasted that last year during budget time. And because of the nature of birth to, to three, we may continue to experience some volatility in this area. Um, I just want to also share with you uh, preschool enrollment history. So because it's almost a rolling admissions process, we take uh, data in three times during the year, September, January, and June. And for the sake of not making this slide even more busy. Um, I'm just going to give you the September and the June marks, but you can see certainly, no surprise, that our enrollment numbers are higher in June than they are in September. Um, you will see certainly this kind of increase uh, in the years of 13, 14, and 14, 15, with a peak in 15 and 16. Um, and I put an asterisk there because that is when the board supported an additional 0.7 preschool teacher. Now you might look at 16, 17 and what we're projecting for 17 and 18 and say, but Sue, there's a decline. Uh, why wouldn't we experience a similar decline in staffing? My response to that is twofold. One, I think in 14 and 15, we were understaffed based upon needs. So I think the adding of that 0.7 was spot on. And what these bar graphs don't represent and what I alluded to before is intensity associated with a student's disability. So I think we are appropriately staffed um, for preschool as far as certified staffing goes right now, but certainly wanted to share with you that history and that look back. Any questions before I move to the leadership team on anything related to budget so far? What is our special ed percentage student ratio? 
do you mean overall like a, an incident rate? Yeah. We're at about a 13% incident rate overall um, each month. We take a look at that very closely. Matt and I sit down and look at the incident rates as well as principals. Um, what you will find is that our elementary schools are 10% and under. Our middle school right now um, is about 12.5%. And you're going to see a higher incident rate right now at the high school. And again, I think that's represent. We knew that that was coming, and it's representative of this population of intensity that's continuing moving through the high school. Uh, we had more incoming ninth graders than we did graduates, and that also increased that percentage. But we look at it not only by district, uh, but also by building. I know that statistic is always kind of, I think, eye-opening. But again, that's that's uh, people who have ch children have an IEP. Correct. Okay. And, and statewide, the average is much lower. Um, it it's, uh, it's hovering around that 12.5 percent. Okay. When you look at specific uh, DERG information, you'll see spikes all over the place. Um, and we, this is something that I often bring up to area directors talking about their incident rate um, impacts. Uh, the incident rates uh, districts around us um, are pretty similar. I wouldn't say that we're an outlier by any stretch of the, the imagination there. Um, so what isn't volatile is our leadership team. Although we've had some ins and outs with our leadership team, I just want to take a moment to uh, really just commend uh, our team. I'm excited about our new members, certainly Nancy Forsberg, uh, certainly Katie Crisula, who is here in the audience this evening as well, um, department supervisor for Simsbury High School. And then we have some incredible returning leaders. Uh, Leah Coe is here for preschool, Heather Tannis for Henry James and Christine Golden, who's the department supervisor for related services. Um, I couldn't be more excited about this team. Uh, we have the right leaders in the right places to move our work forward for students um, with identified needs. Um, so now I just want to kind of delve into the special education Big Five. Uh, this is what you're going to, you've heard me talk about the Big Five and the opening report. Relative to special ed, um, these are uh, in really areas of focus, um, are areas of continuous improvement that you are going to see in the coming years. These aren't things that are coming off the plate next year. They are areas where we are going broad and deep, where we real, really feel like we can get some incredible results with our students students. So Nancy's just going to start off by chatting with us about the achievement gap. Sure. So we talked about the fact that there still continues to be an achievement gap with our special ed students. So what are the things to, to look at addressing that? And that's been a big bulk of my discovery process being being here. First of all, one of the things that happened prior to my coming is a transition when we're talking about teacher evaluation. Traditionally, as part of teacher's evaluation, we looked at success of students and their IEP goals. Well, that's great to be looking at that and that's that's an important part of what they do but we also need to making sure that they're constantly measuring themselves about where kids need to be relative to their regular ed peers so making sure that as part of the evaluation process they're participating in the same kinds of evaluation measurements that their right grade level peers are doing so that that there's that checks and balances of saying yep we know all of our kids aren't there and here's where we really want them to be and making sure that the teachers are constantly raising the bars as best they can. Um, the other piece that it, it's through no fault because there's all of these juggles that, that ESS teachers have to be involved in, sometimes when there were curricular uh, presentations or offerings, our folks weren't at that table because they were focusing in on best practices in special ed or whatnot. Well, that's a nice switch that's happening. Uh, the math uh, adoption is a really great example of that. We've got uh, special ed teachers from different schools who are represent, representing ESS at the table so that they're making sure that A, they're providing that perspective back to the team and we're making sure that our, our folks know where kids need to be relative to the curriculum that's going on. So those are two really exciting places that we're going to see, um, hopefully see some movement with the achievement gap. We also continue our focus with dyslexia. Certainly there's legislative mandate that's calling all districts to pay more attention to dyslexia as a specific learning disability. Um, but here in, in Simsbury, we're taking it uh, some steps further. We have um, 
made a district subcommittee which uh, includes both special education teachers and teachers in our reading intervention program from SRIP and we're looking at um, best practices and what does specialized instruction look like for students who have dyslexia. Uh, we're also uh, diving deeper into our professional development regarding dyslexia. Um, I had the opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Susan Lowell who is an expert in this area and she's a very excited about partnering with Simsbury on this journey. She's actually going to be uh, facilitating with me a PD on January 20th and she's again excited to get her hands working with a district who has the passion uh, to work on these best practices. Great. And then the mental health area, that's that's a huge area that's not just a Simsbury issue but it's a, it's a statewide and a countrywide issue is making sure that we're providing best practices and information and working on uh, mental health issues um, all the way from elementary to, to the high school programming. And we do see an increased need for evaluations for students so our folks are in, in the school psychs and social workers are working on that. Um, we are looking at more support systems. For example, what's available in our, com you know, in our community. I know our social workers are working on compiling data of who's available, how do we get services for kids, so we're bringing that information in. Because we know that kids can't access learning if they've got these mental health issues that are standing in their way of getting that information, especially around school anxiety. We have to get them in the door in order to be able to educate them. So aligning our resources and information to do that, and then looking again like Dr. Um, Susan Lowell's coming, looking at programs around and in the area that can help us with best practices. When we get the kids in the door, how do we keep them there and how do we provide them with mental health services within school that aligns um, with best practice of what we know is research-based. The other component to that is our school psychologists and social workers um, have also f uh, formed as part of their professional growth action research groups around specific areas related to mental health. So they are diving deep into these practices and ascertaining how best to share them with their colleagues, both general education and special education. Um, you'll also, you've heard about transition for a long time, um, certainly from my predecessor, Helen Donaher, um, and it's a, an appropriate area of focus because that is our job, to make sure that once students leave the Simsbury Public Schools, whether that be at graduation or at age 21, that they have a successful transition into college, into work, um, into whatever they decide to do. Uh, so our district subcommittee, we call it the Transition Task Force, we've developed a five-year plan and in five years what we want to be is extremely transparent and um, making sure that we are incorporating those best practices of transition into our everyday conversations into our IEPs so we can assure the best success for our students this year we're really starting at that foundational level assessing our the skill um, of our staff and also assessing our parents Parents need relative to transition. They are huge partners in this work. We can't do this work um, alone. We have to uh, link arms and do it together. And that's been very helpful with the rejuvenation of SEPTO to be partnering and having those conversations. So that's really exciting. Um, finally, um, and most importantly, I think we're always looking at how do we deliver specialized instruction to our students. Always looking at what do our students need starting with that core of the IEP and then how do we take the skills of our staff with those student needs with best practices around instruction and combine them to effective service delivery bless you and also providing a spectrum of how we deliver services from our general education classrooms our co-taught and some students do need more self-contained environments in order to access their education but making sure that we have that spectrum alive and well to service our students most appropriately so I want to kind of conclude this part of our presentation um, with how we started and again that's with the student at the center of what we do because it's about each and every one of them and their success um, so I've asked some guests to come and share two of the truly hundreds of celebrations I can give within the department uh, but first I'm going to ask Christina Nordell and Charlotte DeLeo uh, to come to the table they have really embarked in um, 
offering a new uh, extracurricular activity called United, not Unified, but United Sound. So I'm going to let them switch up here, tell about that, and I'm going to get a little video ready that they prepared. Well, thank you guys so much for yeah. having us tonight. We're very excited to be here. I am the band teacher at Henry James, just to give you a little bit of context. And I'm one of the special education teachers. And um, back in December in 2016, I was able to go to a PD in Chicago. It's this big band director's clinic, uh, three days, <laughs> super nerdy and super awesome. Um, and I attended a session on this program called United Sound. and. I left there saying, we need this at Henry James. We have to do this. And so I got to bring it back to the school and present it and luckily got teamed up with Christina here. Um, and basically the gist of it is it's a peer mentoring program. So we have peer mentors, which are my students from the band program, that have mentored our new musicians. And a lot of these new musicians are students that have never played an instrument before never had this opportunity, um, and it's all student-led. All of the work that you will see in this video has been created by my students teaching our new musicians. They end up rewriting the music so they can play on a concert piece with us based on their skill level. So I think it's amazing when you see the mentors coming up with adaptations for instruments. I mean, we have one student using a trombone and the students um, or the mentors actually came up with putting pipe cleaners, different colors on the trombone to mark where the notes would stop and where you need to stop. And they came up with that because they knew that the student needed that little color coding. Um, so it's it's really amazing to watch what the, what the students do. So here's a little clip. So again, just one of the uh, many celebrations in our department, but want to thank both of these staff members for their incredible, um, you know, looking at this uh, as a, an additional way to celebrate, to um, point out the strengths of all of our students in supporting our students with disabilities. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. It's fun. Very awesome. So thank you. Thank you. And then uh, finally, I'm going to have Jake follow me up here. Jake, I'll sit with you if you don't mind. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Jake for six years now. As he, I first met Jake as a seventh grader at Henry James. Long time ago. Long time ago. <laughs> Makes me feel so old as I sit here and share that Jake is a graduating senior this year. So um, I asked Jake to, sh to share a little bit um, about his journey, and so he offered to do that. Thank you, Ms. Lemke. Uh, my name is Jake Oster, and I'm a, currently a senior at Simsbury High School. Uh, I wanted to talk to you guys about a program that just started at Simsbury High School. It's called the Gates Program, and I'll dive into more specifics about that in a little bit. Uh, two special education teachers at Simsbury High School, uh, Matt Spector and Dan Bergman, over the past summer came up with the Gates program as a way to bring the students together and call ourselves a family. Uh, Gates stands for Growth in Academics, Transition, Employment, and Social Skills. Um, you know, we've, we've done a lot of great events within the Gates program. Uh, every year we do a West Farms Mall trip. Uh, it's from the morning to the afternoon. We shop, hang out, walk around, have lunch. It's just a great time to bring everyone together. Uh, we did a Dave and Buster's night in, uh, I believe it was in October. So it was a lot of fun. We played a lot of games and had dinner. It was a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, 
I won a lot of tickets. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even count how many I have. Uh, um, Would you get like a piece of gum with? I'm actually, I'm, 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 I'm actually just saving them until for something <laughs> big. Uh, you know, uh, as you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas just rolled around, and uh, we had parties for both of those occasions. Uh, in fact, Miss Lemke went to the Christmas party. Uh, we kind of did some very interesting things there. We did the Harlem Shake. That's that's way back a long time ago. And uh, we did the mannequin challenge, and uh, those were uh, those were a lot of fun. They were a lot of fun. And, uh, we did not show those videos today. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, another, Thanks for bringing it up. We yeah. might, we might, <laughs> we might regret those. <laughs> uh, we did. We uh, our biggest fundraiser this year for the Gates program. This is our first year of of existence. Uh, we did sold birdhouse ornaments. I mean, they're not. They're not big birdhouses, but they're like small, good small ornaments. Uh, we sold them at the Chili Fest down at Iron Horse Boulevard back in October. Uh, we did very, we were very successful there. Uh, we had a great time. Uh, we had donuts, and uh, I remember I th throwing the football around with uh, Mr. Specter. That was a lot of fun. And uh, Miss Lumpke came by with her kids and her husband. Uh, we also did another birdhouse sale at Fitzgerald's back in December. Uh, we were we were freezing our butts off, uh, having hot chocolate and uh, donuts, and uh, we did it. We started at around 9 a.m. We finished at 1 p.m. Very successful. Uh, we did pretty well. Um, those are just some great uh, events, uh, and we'd also done some gr uh, great community projects, such as making a. Uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the homeless, uh, for a homeless shelter, what's it called? You, you know, fish. Fish. In up, up in Torrington. And uh, we uh, we made uh, cookies, we made cookies for local organizations within the Simsbury community, and we gave some to the fish uh, shelter too. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it's just a great way to bring everyone together and just give back to the community. Uh, we brought cookies uh, to the Board of Ed, uh, the Police Department, which is right here, the Fire Department, I believe the Chamber of Commerce. We gave some to the Fish Shelter. I can't remember the other ones. You we made a we lot. Made a lot. <laughs> but uh, going back to the PB&J making, we made 146 of them wow. within, I'd say, an hour, sp hour span. And we did that after school. Uh, I'm not the best in the kitchen, so <laughs> but I won't get into my cookie story. Which uh, uh, we are also having a Valentine's Day dance too over at uh, Freemasons Hall on uh, February 11th. Uh, you know, Gates is just a program that's up and running, and I'm very proud to be part of it. Uh, you know, and how how has Gates and the high school helped me to get ready for college? Uh, I've learned to be a better advocate for myself, and I feel that being a strong advocate is a strong asset to a person, no matter who you are. And I, I feel whenever, I'm very good at this, but whenever I feel strongly about something, I want my voice to be heard. I don't want my voice to be left out and just it, in one ear out the other ear, but I just want my voice to be heard. And uh, that's, and I feel that av advocating for yourself is pretty is a pretty strong asset to uh, many individuals. Uh, also, it has helped me to get excellent grades. Um, you know, I'm going off to college next year. It's going to be a big step for me. Um, I've gotten accepted into two schools, University of Hartford and Quinnipiac, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and I've also learned academic strategies like note take, how to be a better note taker, reading comprehension. I mean, those are just many that I've learned over the past four years at SHS. Uh, the, probably the biggest thing, and the, I mean this is the biggest thing, is helping me get out of my comfort zone. Uh, back, I'd say back in middle school, seventh and eighth grade, and mainly ninth grade too, I was a very lonely, I struggled to make friends. Uh, I came home, I, after, when the bell rang after school, I got on my bus, went home, did my homework, sat on the couch, watched TV after that, and uh, it, it was pretty boring because that's just that was the routine that I had. But I remember one day I, I, was, I was having thoughts through my head, and I, uh, I spoke to my parents. I said, Mom and Dad, I can't live like this. 
I can't live like this through the next five years of my essay of my Simsbury education career and uh, I, I, I've, I spoke to a lot of individuals who are very important to me um, who have helped me along the way and I'm very proud of that and I've tried many new things uh, unified basketball um, which is a unified sports is just a great and upcoming program that has been around in fact uh, Special Olympics Connecticut is uh, it's one of the top programs for Special Olympics in the state um, I remember uh, when uh, Dan Bergman was my case manager in uh, sophomore year. We're going to let you call him Dan just for tonight. Though. Okay. <laughs> okay. Back to Mr. Bergman. Mr. Tomorrow. Bergman. <laughs> but uh, anyway, just so everyone knows his name. Uh, he and I were having a conversation one day, and he was telling me about unified basketball. I had no idea what it was because I was never really involved in anything. So he, he spoke to me about how, you know, how great – unified basketball would be for me and all the friends that I would make and I said you know I'm, I'll talk to my parents and I'll get back to you on that so I believe uh, it was uh, one day the, uh, one day during the latter part of the week and I uh, forget who we were, it was a game day actually we were I forget who we were playing and uh, I remember walking into the gym and seeing all the kids run around shoot baskets warm up the whole nine yards, and uh, I remember uh, when uh, Mr. Bergman and Mr. Spector saw me, they had that smile on their face, and you know, it made me really feel like I was part of the team. And uh, in fact, uh, that that was the first year I joined. Uh, in the we every year we have a CIAC league tournament up over at Windsor High School in Windsor, Connecticut, um, and uh, we. Uh, it was a semifinal game against Windsor uh, with about 20 seconds left, and I hit the game winning three pointer. <laughs> nice. So it was, you know, those are just some of the great memories that I've had. And unfortunately, this is my last year of Unified, but I wish nothing but the best for them <coughs> over the next many years. Um, I am also, I worked uh, for SCTV three, for three years broadcasting boys' varsity basketball games over at the high school. Uh, great crew, uh, great people who have the passion to do what I love to do. I'm always, we always get to the games early, go over stats, mm -hmm. go over all the players, and uh, tr truly, it was truly an amazing experience. I'm also the PA announcer, voice of the Trojans for the boys varsity baseball team. I started out during freshman year. I enjoy going to every games, uh, just seeing all all my friends play the game and oh, I'd say the three years that I've been involved with the team those were probably the three best years I'd say the program has ever done mm -hmm. made it this last year we made it to the state semifinals uh, we actually made it to the state semis like two up two of the three years that I've been there and uh, you know just the games are very exciting they're a lot of fun uh, those are just tremendous memories that I have and this year I'm also one of the managers for the boys' varsity basketball team. And we're doing pretty well uh, right now. <laughs> uh, I think we have a record of 5-2. and two. So uh, my goals for next year is to planning on attending college next year uh, to major in sports management or communications. Those are two fields that I feel really passionate and strongly about. Uh, my dad is in the sports uh, industry, so uh, I kind of want to go like in his direction working with a professional sports team and uh, just being part of that team environment it creates such a warm feeling that every day uh, you'll love doing your job because there are some people who work and they don't like their job but it's I feel it's important to you know have a job that you love and you have the passion for and uh, I feel like I've done a lot in reaching that goal um, I'd just like to say thank you for taking the time to listen to me, and I'd just like to th say thank you for the excellent education that you guys have provided me, uh, Mr. Curtis, Mr. Sullivan, Ms. Lemke, Mr. O'Brien, and Mr. Spector. Uh, I couldn't have done it without you guys, so thank you. Thank you. Great Thanks, job. Jay. That was great. Thank you so much. So just want to um, end by...
sharing that story and have Jake share his story because it's through your support and the collective efforts of what we do here in special education that makes Jake's <laughs> stories and so many stories of, of other students a reality. So thank you. I don't know if the board has any I questions. think Jake's most important point was that you have to have a passion for what you do and you guys do have passions <laughs> to teach these kids and to make the, these uh, every student in our school district be, find success. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight too. Mm -hmm. We appreciate this appreciate the support you're all here. I know. <laughs> that brings us to our second round of public audience. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to share? Okay, that said, um, our next board meeting is Tuesday, January twenty fourth. Look forward to seeing you all there. <laughs> Thank you for coming out, everybody. I would accept a motion. Motion. Second. Motion. Sure. Motion sure. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Nice job. Thanks.